I hope everybody had a great Halloween. I hope you had a great weekend. Thanks for including me in your weekly routine. If you're just here for John Heater, maybe you'll like the episode and you could follow us and write a review afterwards. We'd appreciate that. You could follow us on the handles at Ryan. Uh, inside of you pod on Twitter at inside of you podcast on Instagram and Facebook. That is correct. You can also watch the show on YouTube, which is always fun. Please write a review. Please follow us on our handles. Um, what else? What else we got going on? We have the Inside of You store. A lot of cool stuff, new stuff, merch, autographed, Smallville stuff. It's called the Inside of You online store. Uh, I'm on the Cameo if you want a message for your friend or your brother or your aunt, whoever. doesn't really matter. I do some of that. And uh, we're going to be at some conventions. Tom Welling and I, we're going to be in San Francisco at the end of the month. We're going to do a Smallville Nights or we do a show together, a two-man show. Um, and then we're going to be in Columbus and then Pittsburgh back to back to back weekends at San Fran, Columbus and Pittsburgh, I think something like that, but just check my Instagrams, Tom's, we're going to put out a video with all that stuff. Come visit us. It'll be fun. Today's guest is a good friend of mine. He lived here. He was my horror movie, uh, buddy and he moved away. And uh, we have a fondness for horror movies, and that's how we became friends. We were at uh, Universal Horror Nights, and uh, yeah, we hit it off. Great guy, family man. Um, he was Napoleon Dynamite for God's sakes. Legendary role, Blades of Glory. Without further ado, let's get inside of John Heater. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You. Michael Rosenbaum Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. I just always, I love shorts. I love wearing shorts. My guest today is John Heater and he's getting comfortable. As underwear his, uh, all shows. <gasps> oh, what are you going to do? <clears throat> I'm going to keep adjusting. Hey, we're wearing the same shorts. Uh, my, We are wearing the same shorts. Basically. Basically, oh, so basically, that? that was a great story, wasn't it? That was. And, we were. And uh, now that, yeah. Now you can explain. It. And it's not we. You were. I was in the airport, and I don't know what got into me, but this guy was loud on his phone, folks, and uh, he was just like, you know, so my, so, so basically, like he wanted everybody to hear him, but for some reason, I responded, and I go, mm. so basically, and he turned around and was like, gave me the finger, I was like, fuck you. And so he tells me the story and I'm laughing because that's funny <laughs> for a number of reasons, mostly because you deserved it. Yes. <laughs> but he also went over the top. No, he was people, people talking there. He might have been annoying. Yes. But he would have deserved it had you had company with you. You were this is Michael like he you're alone. You're so used to doing this with your buddies that you forgot like. You can't do that. that. You're alone. Like, wh- not that you should do that when you're with your buddies. That's straight up just a gang of bullies. But it's <laughs> rarely you see solo bullying because well, I didn't bullies say, I didn't, yeah. will do stuff for the attention, for the validation, for like of the their peers. They're like, oh, I want to look tough in front of my peeps. So right. they will make fun of someone. They will whatever. Well, I didn't make fun of someone. You straight up mocked him. <laughs> Well, he was just so loud. And I was like, so basically. And he's like, yeah, phew. And flicked me off. Right? And, did you see anything you, wrong with what I did? But I feel Everybody like, wants to do that, but they don't. I did. But if I was there, I wish I could have seen. This is probably how it went down. He's talking. He's passing you. And you go, so basically. And then you look to your two ghost companions who weren't there. Just like, <laughs> am I right? Or or even worse, someone else you didn't know passed it. And right, they're like, get off me, you creep. Exactly. And, I had nobody to turn to. And, you were like, and I just kind of looked at him and go, oh, And you're kind of like, oh, that was true. Did yeah. I say that out loud? Yeah. And then he's thinking, did I say that out loud? Yeah. I, anyway, you know. I thought I'd share that story with yeah, you guys. Great. Uh, John um, was one of the first guests that has spent the night at my house. He spent the night last night. We he, he lives out of town. He moved away. He said he promised he would come visit more. But he has a family, a big family. They live in um, Oregon. And uh, we he, technically live in Washington, Washington. Right, on, right on the border, right on the border. But you came down and we had a big horror movie night. We do our horror movie nights and we watched uh, Black Phone, which we won't we won't review. 
what you just said the word and now we have to say like i i just don't want to like you know other than um, we won't give spoilers but the trailer does that enough yeah but like, it I gives I, everything away all i'll say folks is i don't want to get in the movie it's not important about how good or bad the movie was it is because you and i used to have a patreon where we were reviewing it was horror literally movies. called where have all the good horror movies gone right. horror movies you uh, say horror, horror i say horror 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 what did movies. you say, Ryan? Uh, horror. horror. I say horror. 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 It's horror. a horror movie. It, it was where have all the good horror movies gone? And we would rate movies. Because we were just, we love a good horror movie, but we, they're just hard to come by. And so. And anyway, this movie, uh, we uh, we we didn't really enjoy it. No, we weren't. Into it, it. Was a, it was a shame, too, because I had to rent it. And it was 1999. And it looked nice. Yeah, it looked nice, and there were some moments, but uh, I thought Ethan yeah. Hawke was really good, but the movie was just lackluster. Anyway, you came down, and you've been busy with your life, and I don't get to see you a lot, so it's good to have you here. Um, you know, let's let's go back. Let's go back a little to the beginning, how it all started, because you were living in, you were born in Colorado, right? Yes. And you grew up there? No. You grew up in o Oregon? Yeah. How old were you when you moved from Denver <laughs> or from uh, Colorado? Uh, no, Fort Collins. I was born in Fort Collins. Uh, I love having that connection, but you know, whenever people are like, "Sweet," I was like, "Well, we moved when I was two, so." I oh, really? I, so yeah. you have no recollection? Yeah, really yeah. No, like my that. dad was—he was a doctor, and he then moved to. We were conceived in Japan. Well, that will become full circle later on. But what my, do you mean you were conceived in Japan? My parents, right before moving to Fort Collins, Colorado, he was stationed. He was in, stationed in the military as a doctor in the military. Right. Uh, at a base in uh, Yokozawa in uh, just uh, north, wow. southern southern part of Tokyo. So they were uh, stationed there. And we were conceived there. They moved to, I always like to, you know, I like that little, you know, brag. I was, we were made in Japan. Made in Japan. <laughs> Made in Japan. So then we go to, uh, yeah, Colorado, born there. And then they soon moved uh, to Oregon. And that's right. where we I spent the rest. Of my and life. so your dad's a doctor. When you say doctor, were you, is it a family physician? Is he? Did, yeah. So did he, was he your doctor? Yeah, he was, uh, he was my doctor. But the f beauty and the funny thing about, you know, kind of growing up in a family, you know, where your dad's a doctor is like, I never went to the doctors. I never went because my dad would just like, do his checkups at home? Well, I guess. would he do like a cough kind no, of check? He would never. No, I mean, because you have to have those eventually. I guess so. I think he just is like could monitor us just far enough away. Like, all right, like he was always like the very chill because Rama, I, I've told you this before. So my dad was a doctor. It was perfect because he was also the ultimate scout master. Like growing up, we were in scouts, and he we literally just came from Oregon. Uh, for a celebration for my dad, uh, we gave him the Golden Beaver Award, which Ooh, is actually exciting. kind of a made-up award. Golden well, the, Beaver. The Silver Beaver, for those in Scouts, Silver Beaver is like one of the highest awards you can get. You would only get as a leader, not as a scout. But we kind of made up this one, the Golden Beaver, because it's better than Silver. But it was kind of our way of just, we got all of our old friends, people that were Scouts under him, leaders, and we just got a like a group of like 70 people and we kind of commemorated like my dad's life. We showed video, we had memories and we had people telling stories. Uh, it was really awesome. And my dad, you know, he really changed a lot of lives. He was incredible as a scout. Yeah, master. you really look up to your dad. Oh, yeah. I really, it's nice. It's nice to see that the family just all supports, you know, oh, yeah. your family's very supportive. You're all very, for the most part, very close. Yeah, yeah. And he, uh, so yeah, being a scout master, he was, he was, put a lot of that and a doctor he put a lot of emphasis on first aid and it was very much like you know <laughs> there's a famous story in our troop growing up where we had this kid who like they were out on a camping trip and they was climbing over this old log with a branch and he fell and impaled right into his leg and Oof. i mean blood was coming out what'd your dad do it's not what he did <laughs> It's what he made the boys. The boys had come up like, uh, brother heater, brother heater, because he was it brother was a, heater. Yeah, it was, it was a scout troop, but it was also through our church, right? And so, what do we do? What do we do? And he was like, well, you guys know your first aid. Start treating him for shock, and and he was just like, you know what to do. He's like, you've been training. And you so, guys handled it? Well, I was, so I wasn't there. I was, there was. It was a famous story. I wasn't there, but like I know the guy. I just saw him again. 
Um, but yeah, they treated him for shock, wrapped him up, uh, cleaned the wound, and uh, and it was. I mean, it's a very famous story. Famous true. story about your father. Because he was he, just like, yeah, you, you guys do, do this. You know what to do. You know Let's what to do. do. I've taught That's you. That's a teacher, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh yeah. That would have freaked me out though. Yeah. So I no, never. But you're right here. You're a doctor. No, but I don't <laughs> care. Like, you're. I get that you trained us, but this is. And he was like, no, this is not out of your realm. You right. guys can figure it out. So you're. I mean, you you really look up to your father. Like you you guys are very close. Was he always very supportive of everyone in the family and just like always loving and. Was he that kind of father? He's that he's the kind of father that was like he he his father left when he was oh man, I should know this, but it was when he was he was young. He right. was probably like almost a teenager and he was the oldest in his family. And then his dad left. And so he oh. um and that that's a whole nother story, which was really kind of came full circle a few years ago when my grandpa when his father died. And we started to get to know him, but my dad was very forgiving. Like after years and years of like having been separated, you know, he started spending time with him because he knew he wasn't going to live much longer. And so, wow. So he embraced him. Yeah. And when he probably resented him a lot. Well, I, it's weird. He never opened up that much about his, re he just never had much of a relationship with his dad. And after his dad came, like he moved to Hawaii and had a whole nother life wow. in Hawaii. He left his family, left and went with uh, another woman. And then, but then he built a whole other life where people like he, he did amazing stuff. It really was a lesson in learning. Like, like you left this family and a terrible thing. You went on to start this other life where he, his dad was a doctor as well and changed people's lives. He saved this family like in, from a, an abusive relationship took them under his wing and he got married to this woman. And then he had like a whole new family. It was an incredible person, did incredible things. I still meet people who sometimes like, oh yeah, your Dr. Heater, your grandpa delivered me because he was a OBGYN as right. well. Um, but that's crazy. Yeah. The juxtaposition of like, wow, horrible. He leaves one family. Yeah. So you're like, this guy's an asshole. And then at the same time, he goes and becomes this great man somewhere else. It, it was it's just, it's it, odd. It's very odd. And when we went to his funeral, I started meeting, you know, family members I'd never really talked to or had ever met before. And you just start getting all these stories from both sides. And, and it's not that everything's justified or there was no answer. There was no perfect balance, but it was, but the, but the end of that was my dad forgave him. My wow. dad forgave him. It was really the incredible. And, forgiveness, and I think a lot of some of his other siblings, some of the, uh, his other siblings that hit, you know, worse, but, um, but your dad made the most of it and became this great man that you and his, up to. Yeah. And in the last like 20, 15 years, of my, you know, grandfather's life when he moved back to the States and he moved up to Washington. So he was only one state away from my dad who you know, was living in Oregon. So he would make trips up and he wanted to have this relationship with his dad. And so coming around to answering kind of your question, like <clears throat> my dad never wanted that. He, he saw what his dad did and he was like, I want to be the kind of father who's around but he's very, he has, he's a quiet, quiet dignity kind of describes a lot of his persona. He was not, we don't know where, where me and all my brothers and my siblings, my sister, we were loud, rambunctious. We were all into film and making videos and being creative and being into art. It, and my dad didn't have a scrap of that. My mom, you know, she, she didn't really, she was an artist. Like, we don't know where any of that came from. Right. And my dad, who was just very, you know, everything was logical and everything was just like, he was our resident Vulcan. <laughs> he, right. he was just like, but I mean, but he, he governed us and he raised us and he loved us with, uh, like if my dad, if we did anything wrong and my, all my dad, he never like punished us physically right. or anything. He was just, he could give me a look like, I'm just, I'm upset. And that was enough. I was just that like, was I it. Oh yeah. I wish my dad could have just given me a look. Sometimes <laughs> I get the hand. Sometimes the, hand from hell. the marks are still. <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. still mar Inside of you is brought to you by Shopify. I love Shopify, guys. Um, you know this podcast. We didn't have much to sell in the beginning, and it was like a T-shirt and. 
using Shopify is so easy. I thought, oh, I'm going to have to give this to a company to handle, and they take a big commission, and they're going to have to handle all this stuff. But Shopify makes it so easy, uh, easy for me. It makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere. That's what's great, whether you're a big business or small business. Uh, now I have tons of items to sell. I could tell which item is selling the best, the least, um, how much money I've made, how much money. Uh, it just There's so many things, and it's it's very easy. It's just a screen and a, top, a list on the left of what you need to do. Analytics. Let's see uh, what we're doing this month. Press it. Done. Oh, look at that. Uh, I made this much this month. It's easy. Shopify is glorious. With Shopify, you'll create an online store in your vibe. Discover new customers and grow the following that keeps them coming back. Shopify has all the sales channels sorted so your business keeps growing from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even across social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks to 24-7 support and free libraries full of educational content, Shopify has got you every step of the way. Yes, whether your thing is vintage teas or recipes for ghee, start selling with Shopify and join the platform, simplifying commerce for millions of your favorite businesses worldwide. It's how every minute new sellers around the world make their first sale with Shopify, and you will too. Huh. Shopify makes selling simple so you can put yourself and your ideas out there. Whether your thing is making ebooks or earrings, Shopify makes your success possible. When you're ready to launch your thing into the spotlight, do it with Shopify, the commerce platform backing millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. Go on, try Shopify for free and start selling everywhere. This is possibility powered by Shopify. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash inside, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash inside to start selling online today. Shopify.com slash inside. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. The amazingly talented people who appear on my podcast and me, let's be honest, may seem like we have it all figured out, but we obviously don't. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual. A trained therapist is the next best thing. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be any simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash inside. That's BetterHelp. H E L P dot com slash inside. Now I know so, your yeah. dad now was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Yeah. Yeah. And now that's gotta be a horrible thing. I mean, how many years has he has he had it? He was diagnosed oh boy, it was probably fifth ten, fifth oh man, I it's weird. It's just like almost 10, 15 years. I'm not even entirely sure, but at least 10 years ago. Um yeah, he was diagnosed and uh yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, the amazing thing is, you know, he's lasted longer and done better than, of course, they expected. I mean, you feel like you hear that all the time, like, you know, he, uh, oh, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go as well, or he'll go downhill quicker. And he's lasted a long time. Our gauge, I, I was telling you this earlier. Our gauge is like, when does he stop going? on backpacking trips. Cause my dad, you know, again, yeah, I started, you guys, we all grew up, that. you know, in scouts, but the big thing was he was just loved getting us outdoors, loved getting us camping, doing these, you know, physical activities to learn first aid, to learn, you know, self-reliance, to learn all these things. But you know, it's still just, uh, we loved it backpacking. And so in our adult years, me and my brothers have tried to pick that back up. Let's go backpacking. Let's bring, bring dad along. Um, and I think sadly this last year, might've been, you know, his last, he kind of told us like, this might be the last one. Cause 
yeah, it's just he's slowing down. And has it, it hit you, know, you? Has it? Do you sort of have you broken down about that? Or I haven't how do you broken deal with down. It? I mean, it, it's it's sad, but he, you know, he's still here, and I don't know. I fear. I've never really lost anyone yet that I've broken down. My grandma, his his mom, was the closest. Like I started, you know, like. I am an emotional person, but I don't cry a lot. But I, I cry I don't notice you things. as an emotional person. Well, I can be. Like certainly <laughs> when I when I watch stuff, like you know, You'll movies, I can up. get I can tear up in movies. Okay. And, and when I think about my, you know, own personal stuff, I can, but I don't it, I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for the moment when something happens, whether I lose my father or I lose any of my kids or my wife, you know. I'm not waiting for that. <laughs> right. Hopefully that's way down the, hopefully I never lose them. They you just lose never me. know. It's they, inevitable, yeah. but right. But I know that moment's going to come where I'm going to break down. Maybe, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, I have broken down, uh, not broken down. It sounds weird. Like off to the side of the road, but sort of um, just depressed or no. And I've definitely def more, more in my adult years in my father years. Yeah. There have definitely been times around my kids, about my wife where I've, you know, I've cried and, um, you know, during hard times. So right. no, it happens. But I think in terms of losing someone, I think, you know, if when my dad or mom go, you know, I, you know, yeah, it's, but it hasn't hit me yet because he's still here. I live closer to him now. I get to see him more often. Um, and he, it's just, it's a hard thing. I, I, You're I just trying got, to live day by I can't, day. Yeah. I don't know if I can accept it. Like it's, I don't know, but he's still there he's and still he's there. still mentally uh, amazingly. And I don't know all the effects. I know that sometimes, you know, dementia can roll in with any kind of, you know, sure. si um, disease or uh, situation, but it hasn't really hit him that way. Yeah. He's slower speech and he's quieter. Um, but he's still there. You is know? he still your physician? No. <laughs> Does he not ever check? No, up he's on done. Me? He's no, yeah, I know, not, I know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He checks me out. So, uh, no, I will still go. I will still will still go to him for you know medical advice for sure. When you you do you, you oh, yeah. say something because I've never I've always kind of like I think I got used to because I had a dad as a doctor. I never went to a doctor, so I just I don't even have a doctor now. It's terrible. I should. I need I need to sure. get checked up regularly because it's a good thing to do. <laughs> he looks in the camera. I looks in the uh, yeah. <laughs> but anybody want to give John a checkup? But I I I got so used to like yeah and. And uh, I, I need to. So, but if, if something's like wrong with the kids, like dad, what do you do again for this? What do you do? For <laughs> right. Yeah. What, uh, what was their response? Cause they don't seem like they'd be like your, your parents, were they really excited for you or did they want you to get into acting when you started? Like when you did Napoleon and you showed them, did you show them the, the short film that you made in college with Jared Hess? Did they see the short film? Did you, did you show them things that you were doing? I, I must have showed them Peluca, the short. Peluca that we was did. the original. Peluca, yeah, Napoleon. I must have showed it. I was very proud of Peluca, and I loved it. And I must have showed it to them because I showed them all our videos. So my, you know, my brother and I, we made videos all throughout high school, and I right. showed anybody I could show it, <laughs> like anybody who's willing to watch. I showed it because that's what we do as filmmakers. Yeah. You know, this so is great. Exciting. Well, and no, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you we think hope, everything's great. Hope you're, you have to know your audience. Yeah, yeah, and that's a huge thing. And even at a younger age, I think I had a pretty good idea of who my audience. And and my dad has always been like, he wasn't really big into movies. Every now and then he would take us, you know, to the, but it just wasn't him. And so I must have showed him. I don't remember because it's like eh, dad's not going to get this. But when Napoleon Dynamite became such a phenomenon, were they sort of like? Because when 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 I hit success, my I took my grandparents to a convention, and there was a line wrapped around, and uh, my grandfather goes, "Who are all these people in the line? What's wrong with who them? Who are they here for?" I'm like, "I think they're here to see me." And he goes, "What the hell is this? What is wrong with these what people? Is, this is it. This is crazy." He couldn't, it was mind blowing. And to see the look on his face of like, well, my grandson has some kind of accomplishment here. He did something that people recognize and they like him. Yeah. They were blown away. I took him to Planet Hollywood for a premiere once and they, 
I just seeing the look on the face on their faces made me happier than I've ever been. Seeing so how happy it. they were yeah. for me made me happier than I could ever be. So did your parents did, when did they know something's different? It here? was a it was a little bit of a um I say a curve. It it took a little bit of time because but which is interesting because Napoleon almost I say Napoleon took a little bit of time, but in, in the terms of, you know, having it come out in June of 2004, but most people will tell you, Oh yeah, Napoleon was an overnight success. Right. Even though it was, it took its time, but it was like out of nowhere. It felt like it was an overnight success because it, it came from nowhere. Right. Nobody was in it that anybody knew. Right. So yes, it was instant fame, but you know, it still was like, I did this movie. My parents knew I was shooting this movie and they knew I was dabbling in the acting. And he was just like, yeah, well, that's what they did on their videos. We made videos and we directed them, but we would act in our act. I'm doing finger quotes, right. act in our videos. <laughs> we we would be on camera because I loved goofing around in front of the camera as well. So th it wasn't a surprise. And my oldest brother and my old and my sister as well, like they did like high school plays they were all, especially my oldest brother, he was into drama. He was into the school plays. So that was actually, everybody thought he was going to go and be the actor. Um, so when I just started doing it, it was just kind of like, they knew we wanted to get into Hollywood somehow. Right. And into the movie making. So it wasn't that big a surprise with that. But we do Napoleon. Napoleon's coming out and it goes to Sundance. And Sundance, I tell everybody, that's really when my life changed. Everything changed. Was was Sundance because that was the first validation, right? That was the Could first. Could you just audience. feel what happened? You went to a screening for it. It was the uh, you would call it the premiere, the but premiere. it was at Sundance. It was the first screening, packed Huge, house, packed. It was packed. Uh, it was it was like one of their biggest venues there. Um, as big, if not bigger than yeah, way bigger than a normal. Was movie. Was the first thing. time you had seen the movie? Yeah, I I had seen part. I don't know if I saw the whole movie, but I saw Rough Cut, which, you know, <laughs> that early on in my career, I was like, mm -hmm. I cannot watch a Rough Cut again of a no. movie I'm in. Yeah, I know. Because I was just like, this is bad. They're like, no, 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 the sound's not done. The picture's not locked. You know, yeah, it's whatever. hard to comprehend. Yeah. So I um, so I just kind of put that out of mem memory and waited for the first screening to really, you know. Were you nervous it. at the screening? I was not nervous. You the, weren't? No, Jared, the director, he was sitting right, you know, I think right behind me or next to me or whatever. He was nervous. He was dry heaving because this was his baby. He was dry heaving. Yeah, he was like Nauseous. off to the side. Yeah, he was, he was nervous. He was absolutely nervous. And I was like kind of thinking, Jared, what, like, what have you got to lose? We're not anybody's right now. Like we've got nothing to lose. So if it's no good, if people don't like it, and then, you know, it's embarrassing for a small amount of people in my life. Right. But I also knew we did the short. I believed strongly in the product. I was like, dude, I think if it's not great, it's not going to be terrible because they just don't get it, you know, whatever. Right. But we watched the first, the first screen. It was just, it was one of the most memorable moments of my life. Inside of You is brought to you by Freedom Grooming. I, I've said this before, but I wish there was a razor like this when I was doing Smallville and they were shaving my head. I was getting nicks and cuts and irritations, Ryan. Ingrown hairs, Ryan. Blood trickling down my face. But not anymore with Freedom Grooming. Uh, you know, one of my friends, he's bald. He uses this. He's like, I, I wish I had this 10 years ago. It makes everything so much easier in your life. At Freedom Grooming, we make the Flex Series Electric Shaver, which is uniquely designed to flex and contour to the curve of your head for a smoother, faster, and safer shave without the risk of nicks, cuts, irritation, or ingrowns. Get the smoothest shave of your life. Flexible blades contour to the shape of your head for a baby smooth shave every time. Shave 50% more hair in a single stroke compared to traditional razors. Expect shave time of 2 to 3 minutes, not 10 to 15. And never cut yourself shaving again. The Flex Series Safeguard technology means no nicks, no ingrown hairs, and no problems. And the Flex Series waterproof design means you could shave in the shower with or without shaving cream. Shave wet. Shave dry. 
Since even the sharpest blades dull with use, Freedom created the Close Shave Plan. With the Close Shave Plan, you'll never run out of fresh, sharp blades delivered to your door every six weeks with free shipping. All active Close Shave Plan members are upgraded to a lifetime warranty, and it's completely customizable. Adjust, skip, or cancel your plan anytime. 10,000 five-star reviews for Freedom Grooming. Stop deli slicing your scalp with traditional razors. Try Freedom today. Or get it as a gift with your exclusive 20% off by going to freedomgrooming.com slash inside. That's freedomgrooming.com slash inside. Inside of You is brought to you by Geico. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, Geico can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, add the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. What was it like? What was it like? Are people coming the up to you? And shot, the, the first shot of the film, you know, he's standing there. I'm standing there with the trapper keeper waiting for the bus. And that's when people just like, they started laughing. And like, Immediately. Kind of, like, kind of like, yeah, kind of chuckling. And then because people in an audience, especially at Sundance, and they know they're with the filmmakers, people want to be the first to discover something. So they're willing. They're going out on a limb to take a chance. Right. They're willing to like be the first people who are like, no, this is awesome. And then if it doesn't do well, then they might, you know, retract that statement later, but right. they want to be ones to say, no, I was the first one to see it. If it, in, ca in case it does, you know, find success. Was Yeah. But I think it was also just genuine. People were laughing and was Kirsten, your wife with you. Yeah. She was with me. She was, was she surprised? Like, oh my God, like the response. I don't think she Where, knew it was what, a constant laughter. The, yeah, the whole it was just movie. Like, yeah. It was going great. The whole screening went great and it was building and building. And then, you know, the dance scene is kind of like when you, that's dance. the climax, but it's also the first time I was like, that's where I really put myself out there. And it was so personal to me. Like everything I, everything, every line on the film, Jared has wrote, right. But the dance was all me. <laughs> he just wrote. So how, many takes? how many takes did you do the dance? Well, that was just, it was three takes. Three takes. Yeah. And you came up with your own stuff. Did you rehearse it on your no, own? No, no rehearse. We did like a little rehearsal of the first, like two, eight. Yeah, Ryan, you remember the dance. Of course I, remember I mean, how do you not remember the dance? Yeah, it was, uh, it was just, um, yeah, it was just, I just winged it. It was just all free stuff. And people lost it. Yeah, they loved it. They loved it. Cause you're like, this might, Cause Jared and I were saying like, you know, this dance better be, it's not just good, but it's going to make or break. Hopefully it, it all culminates to this moment. And if the dance isn't good, because in the movie, the audience loves it. The, the, the high schoolers love it. Right. And you hope it matches the crowd, the real audience watching it. Right. So you're hoping. And after the dance, then there's that pause and the audience cheers. And then our real audience is cheering. And it was just like, you know, I felt like a million bucks. And I think after that, Jared was like, okay, I'm in the clear. <laughs> you know? Did you feel like um, my life's changing right now? I mean, had to. I remember that feeling when I was in high school and I would show videos that I made. Right. I loved it. I loved that feeling. I would show it to classrooms. I would do class projects and we put that up. And it's that feeling as a, as a director, you know, like, or if any... If you're an actor or director, especially if you're the director or producer, you know, you made the film, you get that high from just like, this is my audience and they're, they're going to watch it and people are loving it and you're doing it for you. But literally just watching this documentary on ILM that we're and, watching and, the Star and, Wars and, Disney and these Plus. filmmakers like George Lucas saying is like me and Spielberg and, you know, Coppola, you know, we did like to make movies for ourselves. And a lot of times like they're doing it to like, you know, a lot of filmmakers go out there like, I want to make the movies that I want to make. But these, I mean, he admittedly is like, we are the filmmakers trying to make movies for people, the audience. 
we want to make movies for the audience. We want to see, yes, we're going to enjoy it at the same time, but we want to wow. We think we know what audiences want and we want to wow them. Right. And I, and that was just part of like, you know, who I was and we want to make something. Now, Napoleon was kind of a personal thing, especially for Jared. You know, he's making something that he needed to make that for him, hoping, well, I don't know if audiences are going to like this movie. Right. You know? So anyways, yes, I knew my life was going to change. Why? Yes. Why? We've talked about this, but I just want to bring it up quickly. Were you ever like, why the hell wouldn't he have done a Napoleon Dynamite 2? Why didn't Napoleon go to college? Why didn't Napoleon do something else? It was such a blockbuster hit, and they do so many shitty movie sequels. There's movies now they make that the first one's not even good, or they make a sequel of something from the 80s that never was good. And then they're, and so it's like you have such a well, huge success. you just said it right there, right? right? What? Well, that's why. Isn't that why then we don't make a sequel? Because it. Well, this was such a big, big success, and the characters were so lovable that you, <laughs> that you, I was dying to see them again. Well, we made the cartoon. Yes, but the cartoon wasn't live action. No, it wasn't live action. It was fun. It was but great. It wasn't, I loved it. It was great. But it, why do you think? A, <laughs> were you a little disappointed? Honestly, B, do you wish there was a Napoleon Dynamite two? And that's all. I just have to. <laughs> uh no i was uh i was fine not doing a sequel um i we never you know when we made it we weren't thinking in terms of like like producers or you know marketability or like franchise which i do remember that said you know i remember pretty early while we're shooting it we knew we were onto something, at least with like all the dialogue in the lines. Like, oh man, you could totally make like Uncle Rico dolls and you could make Napoleon dolls and pull strings and they all have their different lines. Flipping idiot, gosh. Or yeah. like back in 82, I used to be able to throw a pigskin, quarter mile, you know, whatever. Like yeah. they each have their, every character had their lines. So I, I saw that there was something with these, this colorful cast of characters and it, you could, there was could be a life beyond just the film. Right, right. But I wasn't thinking sequel. I just thought, I was actually thinking merchandise. I was like, yeah, you could do merchandise, but, which is so stupid because I should have signed something right then and there. Like, you didn't make oh, any money off merchandise. I think I made a, I think I made a little bit. I don't even. I, not much. Not, no, not much. You yeah, didn't make much it's, off the It's point. negligible. So, but no, when, when they, they started asking, we didn't even think about a sequel. Nobody was even asking a sequel in the beginning. You know, it wasn't until like, you know, probably later that year or the year after when my agents were like, well, you know, Fox is like, they're, they want to do a sequel. Like, would you be willing to do one without Jared? And I think they were just asking because they, they probably. Without Jared, the director. Well, yeah, because they were probably feeling like, uh, I don't know if um, Jared's going to be up for this. And would you say? Because he might have already said no. I don't know. But would you say? I said no. I wouldn't do it without Jared. I was just you, like no because do, this is. Do you regret that? Uh, no, I don't regret. No, no, not at all. Because this was Jared's. This was this was Jared's. Jared. I mean, this was like his life growing up in in, in Preston, Idaho, and it was very personal to him. And I've always, you know, respected out of choice but also just naturally like respected um like the idea that no this is his baby he brought to me he brought me in on this and i'm eternally grateful that i'm part of this family now i'm part of this creation but it's still jared's right. and it's his vision and 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 to do a, a sequel without him just it made no sense nobody i can tell you right now none of the other casts would have done it without him but if you said yes they would have made it if i said yes I don't know. Well, but if I, who knows? There was not a there was not a world where it was gonna. If right. I also, you know, you know all the other actors now. Like we were close uh, by that point. We were like all in it, but we were all like, yeah, this is Jared's thing. There wouldn't have been a world. I wouldn't have said yes if I knew there was a possibility that the other actors would say no. If I said yes, I don't think they would have. I don't know if they would have followed me. I just never would have said yes if Jared wasn't involved. Right. It made no sense. I wasn't ready to make that kind of crap. Right. Um, <laughs> I understand. Because it would have been crap, you know, if it wasn't Jared. And so that's why. And I think Jared was just moving on, trying to do other projects. Nacho Libre, to do, he went yeah. on to do some things. What is, uh, what's the one line people constantly ask you to say? 
Uh, well, yeah, I think the number one line is uh, teenage fat lard come get some ham. <laughs> is that the one? Yes, 100%. And that one took me by surprise because, you know, I thought, yeah, all the accessible lines like flip an idiot, gosh, uh, lucky, all that stuff was like, yeah, you can use that in so many countless situations. People are going to be saying that. And then what I started hearing over and over and over on t-shirts and people come out just like, Tina, you fat lard. You know what our favorite line at home is? <laughs> Tina, you fat lard. It's just like, what? Like, that doesn't make sense. What's your favorite There's, line? You have to have a Tina that you know. She has to be fat and it has to be dinner time or she, there's got to be some hamling or like, there's so many. Tina, come and get it. But people are like, oh yeah, we use it for everything. <laughs> What's your favorite line? My favorite line is, is the, the crystals line. It's like, hold on a second. I forgot to put in the crystals. He's talking about the time machine. And he's just like, he's about to get this gun. And it's just like a super, super like extreme close up of his awkward fingers, putting the crystals in the little, little like hole. And he's like, put the, oh yeah, that's of course the time machine requires crystals to power. When you, when you do the Japanese line, when Japanese scientists explained, explained, did you really flub up the line? Yeah. You did? Yeah. Oh, oh, no. Yeah. I think I flubbed that. But like, you know, I knew Jared and I were so in sync. Like I knew he wasn't going to cut. I was like, yeah, that's just, we're going to make this as real as, you know, this is what he would do. How bad did the shoes that you wore smell at the end of the shoot? They were bad. They were bad. They were like, I don't remember the swell, as, the smell as much as just the feel. They were falling apart. Yeah, they smelled. You had to bad. tape them up. Yeah, we had to tape them up. We had to for the dance scene. It's hard to see, but for the dance, by the time we did the dance, because it was one of the last things we shot. Right. And there's tape around one of the boots, or possibly both, because the soles were starting to come apart. Because we did a lot of running. You, a lot of it is cut out of the film, but there was a lot of running uh, where I would just be in the middle of, you know, Idaho and on a gravel road when I'm like late for the dance or I'm fishing for the bass for, you know, right. for Deb and I'm just running on gravel road and it's just forever. And it's just running, 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 running. And it's like, Oh yeah, those poor boots couldn't handle it. Um, you now are going on little tours to places for screenings and doing Q and A's with two cast members. Yeah. Uh, e- Efren Ramirez. Yeah. And John Grice. And John Grice. So you guys do these how many where do where do where are you going? Oh, uh, we go all over. I mean, all over the country. We're waiting for the rest of the world to catch on, but I think I'm convinced that we are big in English speaking countries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It doesn't translate. I don't think it translates quite well to foreign language. Like when they have to do a dub, it's just not the same when they're like, Kuso, <laughs> you know, like it's like, it's, that's it, your Napoleon in Japanese. Yeah. That's that. Yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I would love to, you know, travel the world obviously to do some of that stuff and we have, but it's like New Zealand, Australia, England, good crowds though. Oh, great crowds. Yeah, no. I mean, if you speak English, you love the movie. And what? That, uh, that where can people get I, tickets to go do this? Um, I don't know. Just maybe, do you post on your Instagram about it? I should. Well, people need to know where to, where <laughs> the know. hell to go here. Yeah, well, they just, they, they um, if it's near you, you'll probably hear about it somehow. Jeez. <laughs> Talk about lack of promotion. That's one thing. I know I, I should I got it. Well, yeah, if it's near you, I probably should, you know, promote it. Um, but I just never I don't. Well, that's also one thing I've always admired about you in a lot of ways that you just don't ever get caught up in the business, whether it's social media or just Hollywood. You love ho- you love Hollywood in yeah. certain aspects, you love movies, you love your family, you love your friends. And the balancing is pretty remarkable. I don't know anybody who it's almost absurd how removed you are from Hollywood, but yet you're still in Hollywood yeah. because you don't live here. You have a full family life. You don't really go on social media that much. You're just yet you're working. Um, how do you do that? Are you just not interested in that? No, it's it is weird because I, I love I always wanted to work in Hollywood where I wanted to make movies and I wanted to get in that 
make movies or or animated. So I, you know, I I majored in animation, yeah. so I was always really into art. I wanted to do art. I just wanted to create. I wanted to create and make you know fun stuff and awesome stuff. And so I I love I love Hollywood for sure. But I think after a while, you know, we were just like, it's hot here. <laughs> It's so hot. I love the Pacific Northwest having grown up there. And so that's why we moved back. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you, man, I, and I, I know I've probably told you this before, but I've always felt like no matter where I'm discovering, like I'm constantly an outsider, constantly an outsider in the way, like not when I grew up, you know, where I grew up in, in, in Oregon, like it was great. Perfect child. I mean, it was, it was a great child. I loved it. I, I'm obsessed with it. And I always tell people like how much, if I could match that childhood for my own kids or whatever, you know, I love that. But, you know, moving, getting, you know, going to college in Utah and getting uh, the Napoleon gig and then moving out to LA. Yeah, for sure. I felt like an outsider. Oh, I'm this, you know, small town guy. I'm not the smallest town, not a total like hayseed, but kind of like, hey, um, I did not grow up in Hollywood. I do not have Hollywood parents or, or any kind of pedigree that, or family tree that you know, worked in the business. So I'm here. I feel like an outsider. I've always, you know, the entire time I lived here, but not in a bad way. I kind of embraced it and loved like, oh, that's kind of what set me apart a little bit. Um, but then, you know, again, like for the reasons I just explained, we moved finally and, um, and I love it up there, but I now feel like, well, I'm the Hollywood guy, or at least it is in my blood to be like in the entertainment industry and up where I moved up into Washington area. It's like, there's not much of that. No, there's not really much of that. And once again, I feel like an outsider, but again, in a good way, like I love it. Um, you know, people around me, I mean, boy, where we moved, there's like countries and farms and, and it's like some very different vibe out there than out here in LA. And, and I love them both. I, I, I yeah, it was hard to leave California. I'm now full on West coast, baby. Like just West Calif coast, baby, baby, w w uh, California, Oregon, Washington. I love, I love it all. And they're all different vibes. Um, but I, uh, I don't know. It's like, I just, yeah, I've always felt like an outsider. And I think that's how I always will feel. But I think a lot of people in a good way, like I, I, I love that. Yeah. Um, no, I get it. I get it. Um, do you, we've talked about this before, but do you, you're not a person who really gets anxiety. Are you? No, it's, it's crazy because four kids married, balancing an acting career and doing all these other things that you do it just seems like every morning would be anxiety holy crap i've got four kids of different ages and going through different things and one shy and one's i know? think it's I, I almost feel like anxiety is the result of not handling stress well like if you get stress and you let it get to you then you have anxiety I don't know if that's yeah, true. But, well, I, I let it get to me. But It gets to me. because. And what I'm saying is everybody will have something to stress about. Every And yes, I will have stress, but then I don't try not to stress about it or at least let the stress affect me too much, you know? How do you do that? I don't think, I think it's just a natural, I don't know. I don't, it's never. The I've way always, you were raised, do you think has anything to do with it? Self-reliance? Um, yeah, it's so hard to say. I mean, it could be. I was always pretty happy. I had, I attribute, I look a lot, I always try to think like what made my childhood, what made me who I am and and why did I feel, I truly felt happy as a kid. Yeah. I, I think a big part was I have a twin brother. Okay. So I always think Damn. about like, I always had a playmate. Yeah. And in this case, you know, I know a lot of twins are different. My twin and I, you know, were like, we're the same, but the same in the way that it was, it was perfect because we liked the same things. We had the same interests. We had the same talents and skills. We were pretty much the same at everything, but instead of becoming a really competitive and, and yes, there's an, probably an underground competitiveness that lays there that therapy would probably unleash like sure, a monster, but I, I, tell. but I, I don't know. At the same time, it doesn't really like we've also been very supportive of each other. Yeah. Um, and 
But, you know, growing up as a kid, you always had a playmate. You always had someone there. And I think that laid a foundation. And also my dad being a doctor and scoutmaster. And even when he wasn't he my scoutmaster, I you? felt safe. I always felt safe. Like everything's going to be okay. And I think that's a huge. Yeah. I don't think I felt that. that. I didn't feel that as a child. I felt like nothing's going to be okay. Yeah. And everything and that, and is in chaos. My life is in chaos. My family is chaos. Yeah. The world around me, everything is in cha is chaos. And I think that that has affected me tremendously. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's, you know, product of your own environment. And you know, I don't know if that was my dad's thinking in his brain, but you know, he was successful and he just instilled that sense of security, but like, okay, but it's not just security. It's safe. It was just like, okay, I felt safe. Even though we maybe sometimes physically we were doing crazy stuff and he had us go on trips, but more like uh, the future, like everything's going to work out, you know, but it's also, I think in large part due to my faith, yeah. you know, and like believing in that, you know, like good will come from our good acts. But even then, like if you are good at heart and you're doing your best, you're enduring to the end, as we say, and you are doing your best to keep the commandments to, uh, to do good unto others and to, you know, just all around be a good person and yeah. to do good and to be kind and do all these things. Um, and to follow, you know, be a Christ-like, you know, person following his footsteps and, and, and be like him. And, and I think that encompasses all the great stuff about just loving everyone. And, and anyways, yeah, everything I say, right. just trying to do good, then all will be good. I mean, and even sort if of you don't, it in you. yeah. And even if you don't experience it, and I'm, there are certainly things I've, you know, like there are times where I feel like, you know, whether it's been hopeless or just like, oh man, this sucks. Or I don't know. Like, I just always feel like, you know what? It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. And that's what I'm trying to do with my kids. Like, and my family is just like, I'm not my dad. I'm not, I'm, I'm not as smart as him. I'm not as talented as him. I'm not as like, I, I'm just not him. I don't want to put myself down, but you know, oh, I, I'm I way don't, more talented than I, my father. I can't create that same kind of, house and you know and so i'm always like if i can just hope my kids feel like they're safe and that everything's going to be as long as they are trying to do their best to be good you know yeah um then you know you're going to be okay and but trust in yourself push yourself you got to push yourself you got to try new things you got to like get out there and and just you know Explore and, and do uncomfortable things to help yourself learn and grow and expand your mind and your body and, and your spirit. Um, yeah, that's cool. I, I like, uh, you know, look, every, you know, different things work for different people. And I've seen religion where it doesn't work. And I've seen religion where it works. You have a close family. You've all gone to church since you're, you know, since you're tiny. And it's worked for you. It's worked for your yeah. family. There's a lot of things that work for you, you know. And it's also I like when you don't see people always saying you should be this. You're you you're 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 a Jew. You should be a Mormon. You should you know you don't like you don't you don't what's the word? You don't uh, preach. Yeah, yeah. You don't preach. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this: Have you ever been starstruck? Um. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Ever struck dumb? Not star struck dumb, but just I've always played it cool. I've always been like, yeah, no, that's great. There's, I can tell you, the few little times I ran into Ali G, uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, yeah, at a par early party, like early in my career, right. And I found that if I was running into people that I felt maybe they're not as big here in the states, or like, or something I had just been watching, I don't know, like. I just remember running into him and thinking, whoa, okay. And at the same party, there's, you know, Mel Gibson or there's, uh, you know, the huge names. And I think they're incredible, amazing, but I didn't get Star Trek maybe because I wasn't meeting them, you know, right. but, it, but even if I was, it was just like, you know, I don't know, like running into him. That was you awesome. got a little starstruck. I got a little Star Trek. I, I was he cool. Yeah, it was very cool, but it was very brief. It right. was just like, Hey man. Yeah. Hey, okay. And then we go, this is Patrick Stewart. 
Really? Oh, was, oh yeah, because I've always like I loved Star Trek Next Generation <laughs> growing up. <laughs> Patrick Stewart, I've always been like, and I would tell people if I could meet someone, I'd love to meet Patrick Stewart. And I finally ran into him. Oh, Actually, thank you very he played much. my dad in a movie. He played my dad. We didn't share any scenes. What was that? It was uh, the Walt Disney one. Yeah, it was called Christmas. No, 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 no. It was called Christmas Eve. It was like it was a small independent film, right. you know. And it was kind of like one of those where it's all these different intertwining stories. So I never shared any scenes with him. I never met him during production. I didn't meet him until we um, we did the uh, like the premiere for the film. Yeah, right, right. And it was, I mean, it was amazing, but it. I don't know. It's like, because we didn't sit and have a lunch. I think I would have been more starstruck if we could be have a one-on-one. Right. Cause then you're like, it's pressure. It's like, Oh, James Cameron was one of the other really amazing. Like I went to a private screening of avatar when he was right before it was coming out in theaters at his, my friend won a like auction. There was an auction where he got tickets to a private screening at James Cameron's personal theater at his, at Lightstorm. And so I go there with my buddy and he's there and he does. And it's only like, you know, 15, maybe 20 people, just like a very intimate audience. Wow. And he goes, he intros the film. He's like, Afterwards, I'll do a little Q&A, you know, no problem. So he comes in after the film and he's just like, hey. And he's like uh, answering questions. And I was like, all these people are licking his butt. They're just ask. They're not even asking questions. They're just saying, oh, it's amazing the, the, what you're doing with this film. I was like, I'm going to ask him a real question, like a geek. So I asked him about like, I was like, so I heard about this really involved process that you did with the motion capture sensors for the face to capture the facial movements. I was like, you want to talk about that or exactly, how did you exactly do that? And he looked at me and he's like, oh, that's a great question. And then he paused and was like, you're John Heater, aren't you? I was just like, oh my gosh. And so that was a huge, wow. like he was like saying, oh yeah, well, me and my family were fans. Um, and that was, that Holy was a starstruck crap. moment for sure. Well, what about working with Will Ferrell? Well, yes. I mean, but then you don't think of, yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, sure. Starstruck, but I don't think it's not starstruck dumb. Like the first time we met was on the ice. It was for training. So he, because (laughs) we, he didn't didn't get a, a, he didn't get uh, connected to the film until after I did like, uh, originally it was going to be Ben Stiller and I. And then Ben couldn't do it. So, you know, but Ben was producing. He was like, don't worry, John, we'll get someone else. I was like, I was so bummed. And then he was like, oh, we got Will Ferrell. I was like, okay, that's pretty cool, I guess. (laughs) No, you didn't. No, of course. I I was like, I was just like, oh, my. Oh, okay. That's pretty sweet. Because so, yes. But the first time we met, because he was so humble, and I think humbled by the ice. Right. I was just like. (laughs) He was, I just remember he was like, you ready to do this? And I was like, this is a perfect thing for him to say. Cause I could see kind of the excitement, but also he knew like I was, I don't know, like I, he was a really cool senior in high school with the letterman's jacket. And I was Lucas, the nerdy little freshman who was being taken under his wing and it introduced me to all his like cool high school buddies. Do you, <laughs> like, could, could you tell Will liked you? Was there something, as you tell he like, or was it just business? And just like, hey, great scene. Or like, or did you guys hang out or what? Come on, dude. What's not to like? <laughs> What's not to like? No, I yeah, he was. I mean, I think he liked me. I mean, he didn't seem like he was very down to earth. Not at all. He didn't BS BS anything. Like he was very kind and sweet. And did he, he make you laugh a lot? Oh yeah. Was I mean, it? it's like, but he wasn't trying. He was just like. He was a filmmaker. Like he was just like, oh, like let's do this. And we think about it and like, all right, let's uh, do this thing. But he was also kind of like just chill and like would make jokes. We'd laugh about people on set or like, oh, what about this guy? And we try things out. I loved work, work, working with him. It was it was a dream come true. Yeah. Um, and you know, I learned a ton. But yeah, he was. I think he liked me. <laughs> uh, I will say this. I will say this. This is cool. So you know. Unlike a lot of other, you know, you know, I've worked with a lot of people and I don't keep in contact with most of them. I mean, not out of choice. It's just like, you know, mm. Will's on another level. And and honestly, I don't have his number. I never got his number. <laughs> we were big and sharing stuff. So, but I, years later, years later, this is the first time I had seen him. Like there was something where we were trying to produce and get made back in 2010. So I saw him then or 20. 2009. Right. So it was years later, 
this is a couple of years ago. We, I go to this, um, uh, the screening in LA for a show that he was in and, but he was a small part in it, but I was invited regardless by, I think my management. So I bring my buddy and we're going and this is my buddy who's not in the business at all. I was like, this would be fun to bring him here. There's a lot of people. It's just, a, it'll be a fun thing to watch. So we're walking around and in the after party, you know, they have all those tents set up and I finally see Will and he's in the back, back corner, kind of alone and, you know, admittedly looking kind of tired and a little grayer than I remember, but it was just, he was tired and, and he wasn't standing, he was just sitting the whole time and everybody around him was like, you know, standing and talking to him, but there wasn't a huge crowd. I don't know. Like it was just, he probably just wanted it to be kind of quiet right. and alone, but and I was like sitting there with my, my buddy. I was like, dude, you have to go. Like you did a movie with them. I was like, I know, I know. But I never like bothering people. I just like, especially at parties, like I don't need to bother them. But it is a party. He wouldn't have come if he wasn't ready to socialize a little bit. So you went over. So I was like, fine. I was like, but I did say to my friend, I was like, watch this, watch this. Like see him. Because the interesting thing, he wasn't standing up at all. He wasn't standing at all. And I'm guessing he was just tired and like, oh, people can sit down or talk to me. I was like, dude watch this. He's going to stand for me. So, you know, I walk over there and finally I was just like, dude, Will, and I, you know, we lock eyes and he's just like, oh, he's like the big eyes. And she's like, John, and he stands up and gives me a big hug. And I was just like looking at my friend. I was like, yeah, yeah, no, no. I was just like, yeah. And it was great to have that reunion. And it was like, oh, I mean, he'll always have a special place in my heart. And I hope I have the same place. That's nice. Uh, lastly, before we get into these, some Patreon shit talking questions with John Heater, uh, I know you hosted Saturday Night Live and you say you don't really get nervous. You say you don't get anxiety. I don't know how one wouldn't get a little anxiety when they're going on national television to do Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you had to be nervous. Yes, I was nervous for Saturday Night Live, but in the good way. Like, I remember this, the exhilar it was exhilarating, which to me what felt like a mix of like, you're nervous, but it was just, I felt like I was in good hands. They were all so prepared and so like, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And it was, it was a weird ride. I'm telling you, like if it was now, I would be more, I feel like it would be more nervous, but I'd be more professional. So maybe I wouldn't be as nervous there. I was just kind of riding the coast. I was always professional, like, but I would probably, you know, input more jokes and put more writing, put, come up with more you stuff. You let them do their thing. Yeah, it was just like, hey, I'm kind of here along for the ride. I don't know what I'm doing, and uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. But I was so young and still green, and I just, I mean, creatively, I still had a lot to, you know, really kind of, you know, blossom, I suppose, right. you know. Um, so it was a great experience, but I was definitely like, I was nervous leading into it, but also like using those nerves and just like, Let's ride this wave, baby, and uh, and have fun. And it was it was a blast. I mean, I was like, I'd easily do this again. Wow! Did you hear that, Lauren? I'd easily do this again. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. It just seems like, gosh, there's so much going on. Lauren's like, yeah, okay, do another hit movie, and maybe I'll let you in. Yeah, get in another hit movie. Uh, this is shit talking with John Heater. These are my patrons, lovable patrons who get to ask questions and, uh, thank you. Go to patreoncom slash inside of you to become a patron. I'll message you. I appreciate you support the show. I love you. Thank you. Here we go. This is, uh, Megan H heater. What's the update on horror movies? Latest ones you've watched, liked, didn't like heater. She says it like we're good friends. Maybe she follow us on. I feel like that's what people say when they really know a heater. Heater, we're friends. What's the update on horror movies? Well, we just gave you an update on one movie. Black, um, black phone. No, we watched one last week that... Um, the Cursed. The Cursed was great. I thought I, it was okay. It was good. No, I didn't think it was okay. I thought it was good. Yeah. Better than okay. We also saw... It was pretty fun. Um, what was the one where the kids have powers? X-Men. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Damn right. It makes sense. He no, it name. was called... The kids remember that in the old apartment building and the, you know, they dropped the animal through the stairwell. Oh my gosh. Why am I blanking on this? Are you sure we did you not watch it with us? Wait, drop an animal. The innocence. Through. Oh, I missed that one. Oh, Thanks for ruining yeah, it. That was pretty good. You mentioned pretty good. the one I missed. That was dark. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, 
I mean, one just, cut, we were just talking about one cut of the dead. Yeah, Go we watch liked, that. We not, watched that. It's not scary though. <laughs> no, but the first hour is the worst movie you've ever seen, and the last hour is one of the best you've ever seen. Yeah. So stay with it. Maya P, what are the best pranks you've pulled on each other? Oh man, you know I real I feel pressured. I'll I'll tell you this in Hollywood, I feel pressured to be a prankster because everybody, everybody, every. St- Every stupid like junket that you go to, press junket, they're like, what pranks so what kind of do pranks do you guys do on set? I've never been a prankster. I've really, and I don't know. I, I was like, I feel like this should be in my nature. I'm a really, f- I like to think of myself as a really fun guy. I think pranks just feel mean to me. And yet, you know, people will get a good laugh as long as it's safe. But it's still like, I'd rather laugh with someone than at someone. Not to say that pranksters are bullies, but. I just, I don't know. I, I'd rather put my creative juices into something. I feel like, I think I fear the repercussion. Really? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, someone's if gonna I get, prank someone's gonna someone, they're going to get me back. And I'm like, and I could be a good sport. That's one thing I will say about like when I did a, um, all those years ago um, when Ashton Kutcher's show. Punked. Punked. Yeah, I remember when that was out and that was popular and it was like, but seeing the show, I was like, this like it brought out the worst in these people. Oh, yeah. Like you just see them like lose their- They tried to punk me many times and Chris, they kept going to Chris, our friend Chris McDonald. Yeah. Who- um, And was, he never- And he, they go, oh, Chris, we want to punk him. We want to punk him. We want to punk him. And he was like, he wouldn't do it. He said, no, I'm not letting him do it. What do you mean do he it. wouldn't? He wouldn't let them do it to me. Why not? Because he knew that I would probably- lose it i'd lose my shit i'd probably lose (laughs) my shit i I would not look good now i was like i remember when it happened thinking after it happened i was like wait i but also leading up thinking like almost like am i gonna get punk no like i'm not a name i'm not like a big enough name so i kind of felt safe but then when it happened i still felt good about the episode because i was did not lose my because they're like if you do any i mean they're like what if we ruin his car he's like my brother who they went to he's like well he's got a pretty crappy car he won't care <laughs> or what if they do this ah oh, he doesn't care about that <laughs> like you can't i you can't like, really get you I, I don't think i would get ever like you know yeah, pissed like I, that I, so I, I lose my shit some of the things they wanted to do i was like you <laughs> new 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 uh chris r what would be your dream project to work on um my dream project would be oh man i mean i still would love to do a I would love to do like a sci-fi action, sci-fi movie, maybe with some action. I did, a, I mean, I did my first real action film a couple of years ago, that Tremors movie. Yeah, yeah, Tremors 5. 7. 7, seven. <laughs> Tremors 7. <laughs> you can get that on Netflix, folks. Um, it's fun. Yeah, I, I mean, but it was like, it was finally doing like something with like, I, I didn't have a gun, but I had like a chainsaw. I had blowtorch. I, I mean, not a blowtorch, but a, um, a flamethrower. Um, and you're running around doing stunts. I love doing action. I really did love doing action. I would love to do more of that. And I love sci-fi. I would love to do a sci-fi. Um, I don't know. Exactly, like, you know, That'd it'd be, be amazing to work with uh, the Coen brothers. Obviously, it would be like a dream come true. Oh, well, yeah. Dana asks, if you can remake a scary movie, what would you remake? I don't want to remake stuff. I want to make new things. No, I would remake a bad movie and make it good, right? How many yeah. movies? I'm trying to think of a movie we've seen like, now that could have been good. Black um, phone. Black phone. Black phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, um, if I could remake a scary movie, what's a, like... I want to make, oh, it would be awesome. They made a movie. No one's made a good Wendigo movie. Like What's they, Wendigo? Wendigo. Oh, if you know your Native American lore from the Pacific Northwest. It's that Do you know spirit, where I am? The Wendigo. Some people Wendigo. Can, uh, pronounce it Wendigo. Uh, they kind of, they made a couple of really, you know, bad movies. But so I guess I would take one of those and try to remake it, but make it cool. All right. The Chief. Where do you disagree or differ on your horror preferences compared with Rosie? Oh my gosh, it's all horror. It's all question. horror based. Well, <laughs> on our preferences, um, they nickname me John Hater sometimes. 
<laughs> we do. We say hater because he hates a lot of. He hates everything. No, I just I think with these guys, our group, and with Rosie, I can be a little bit more honest because I'm always pretty like I. Tr- I think with film, I'm a little bit more critical, which which is weird because I love film and I will be positive, but I love what it can do. And when I see the possibilities, I'll kind of hate on something even if I love it. Right. And try to be positive, but like I'm a little bit more, I think I am more critical. And yet there's been projects that I like that you don't like. So I don't know exactly where we differ. You're more like you really want some good scares, jump scares. And I want scared. I want tone. I want like to be creeped out like almost the entire film. Like I don't care if it doesn't have a jump scare. And, and but if my I think we're both looking for our hairs to stand on end for yeah, sure. For sure. Um and that's that's what we we've both been looking for. But I'm a little bit I, I don't mind mood as much. Yeah. And a slow burn, it can take its time if it's got some cool moments. I'll be more forgiving of subtitles. Yeah. <laughs> Usually the subtitle movies are, are good. A lot of times. Yeah. We we watched that found footage movie. That was pretty good. We all liked. And then there was another one. I forgot what it's called. Titus? Tinnitus? Tin- t- oh, t- Titane. 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 And that was wild. That was weird. Oh, my gosh. Would, anyway. Well, dude, I, I, I liked having you here. I know we only got to hang out for a day, but uh, it was a lot of fun. We went swimming. We went uh, for a hike. We had movie night. We didn't do any we of our lunch. old dives. What are our old dives? Our old dives is your basement. So we, yeah, yeah, we went. We watched doc, the ILM documentary on Disney Plus. We had friends over. Your brother was here. It was good. It was good to catch up. Yeah, we finally did the podcast the, yeah. the right way. The right way. <laughs> yeah, he did it a long time ago, but it's not available. His, the first year he deleted or it because I was so unruly and he was all over the place. <laughs> He was all over I the place. I was trying to like, all right, I'm one of his first guests, but I'm going to show people like I can like do just I lay want. down and do whatever. Because I was, <laughs> I was also calling out. It's like, we literally just had this, everything you're asking me. Everything I, I talked to you. Yes. Normally. Everything you said. Every, like, You've talked to me about this before. What do you, and I'm like, Dude, what do we have to talk about? People don't know this. They don't know. Yeah. But uh, it was a real treat. Thanks for allowing me to be inside you, buddy. Thank you, man. Thanks, John. Love the guy. He's one of my besties in the world. Uh, he just cracks me up. I don't know. He's he's just uh, he's a good dude. He's able to just get out of the adult mode and just be a kid a lot. Just be fun. And I like people who are fun and laid back at the same time. Just easy to roll with it. You're not trying. You're just. He finds me funny. I find him funny. We just get along. And we both hate many horror movies because they're not good. Uh, at the time of this recording, I don't know what Jason was able to use with the wide shot, but I forgot to focus the wide shot on this entire episode. If you were watching, I apologize about that. But. Oh, well, you're just going to have to go back and forth. Then. That's that's what it, what it was. I hope you, I'm sure he found a workaround. I'm sure it was great. Hey, guys, if you're uh, listening and you didn't listen to the intro, there's a lot of cool information about the new CD cons that I'm going to listen to the intro again. If you need that information handles, write a review for the show. If you liked it, I really appreciate you right now. The top tier patrons, we're going to we're going to say their names out loud. They make this podcast possible. They have supported the show since the beginning, many of them. And uh, without them, I couldn't do the show. And uh, thanks for the support for Talkville, our new podcast. We're trying to keep that going. So thanks for the support. A lot of the patrons from inside you are also patrons of Talkville. Uh, go to uh, inside you dot com slash patreon dot com slash inside patreon you. patreon <laughs> dot com slash inside of you to be a patron and really help the show. It really. Uh, it really helps. Here we go. Shout outs. Nancy D. Leah S. Sarah V. Little Lisa U. Kiko. Jill E. Brian H. Nico P. Robert B. Jason W. Sophie M. Kristen K. Uh, you know, I think we forgot to send a box. She's a top tier and she's been a good friend and she's, she sends me stuff and her and Leah made the pillow I'm sitting against. And uh, I just want to give her an extra shout out, Kristen K. We love you. You know that we're going to mess up. We're going to accidentally not send a box or something might break or, and also if you order something, how am I supposed to know who it's for? If, if it's, 
if, if the shipping label says your name, that's who I'm going to write it to on the mugs or the things. Sometimes they're like, uh, I didn't want it for that person. Well, how was I supposed to know? Sorry. Raj C, Joshua D, Jennifer N, Stacey L, Jamal F, Janelle B, Kimberly E, Mike E, L Dan Supremo, 99 more, Santiago M, Chad W, Leanne P, Janine R, Maya P, Maddie S, Belinda N, Chris H, Dave H, Sheila G, Brad D, Ray H, Tabitha T, Tom N, Liliana A, Talia M, Betsy D. Chad L, Marion, Dan N, Big Stevie W, Angel M, Rhiannon C, Corey K, Dev Nexon, Michelle A, Jeremy C, Andy T, Gavinator, David C, John B, Brandy, Carlisle D, right. Camille S, Joey M, Eugene N, uh, Leah, correct, Mickey G, Corey, Patricia, <clears throat> Heather L, Jake B, Megan T, Mel S, Orlando C, Caroline R, Christine S, Sarah S. Eric H, Shane R, Emma R, Jeremy V, Andrew M, Zuduichi 77, Oracy. Is it Oracy? O R A C I E, Oracy. Oracy, Oracy. Chris R, Karina N, Michelle D, Amanda R, Amanda S, Jen B, Kevin E, Stephanie K, Lena 82, Jorel, Jorel, and Billy L. Thank you, Billy. Thanks for being a patron. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, continue to listen, continue to support. I don't know what else to say. There's so many podcasts, and uh, you choose this one to listen to. Um, you know, after a while, when people say they really like the podcast, I start. I'm starting to believe it. I'm starting to believe that people actually like <laughs> this podcast. Good. It's hard because you know it's uh you know you can again you compare. Oh uh, well, that guy gets millions of listeners, and this guy. Gets, I have my loyal listeners, and that's all I need. All I need is people who want to listen. And they give, and hopefully I'm giving, and it's a mutual love and respect. Mutual giving. Mutual giving. Yeah. Uh, I am Michael Rosen from the Hollywood, Rosenbaum from the Hollywood Hills <laughs> in California. <laughs> I'm Ryan Taz. But, uh, uh, big. <laughs> uh, big wave to the camera. We love you. Um, be good to yourself. And uh, thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.